I'm Katy Perry. And I'm Austin Hankwitz, and this is After Earnings, the show from Morning Brew and Stakeholder Labs that brings investors up close and personal with the executives behind the world's most interesting companies. Today, we're talking with Peter Canito, the CEO of Redwire. Uh, Redwire is a space infrastructure company. What does that mean? We're going to get into it. But you can think about it as the picks and shovels of both space exploration and research, which factor into all aspects of the value chain. This interview was super enlightening for me as someone who has no idea about space, what's going on in space, how people make money inside of space. We talked about how they're supporting the national security of the United States against Russia and China, their work with the International Space Station, and how they're working with the creator of insulin, Eli Lilly, to pioneer microgravity drug research. Really interesting stuff. I'm telling y'all, you're going to love this interview. So stay tuned and let's get into things. Peter, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of After Earnings. Can't wait to dive in. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So you all generated nearly a quarter billion dollars in revenue last year. Now, I'm not an astronaut or a space expert. So when I hear a space company is making a quarter billion a year from space, I get really confused. How does your company specifically generate revenue? It sounds like the alien economy is just booming. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not all for them, but the uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, Redwire is a space infrastructure uh, company. So, um, just like any other infrastructure, maybe if you were to use a terrestrial analogy uh, here on Earth, we build things like roads and structures, and we have uh, things like cameras and uh, uh, power generation. Well, you need all of that to operate in space as well. So, um, as part of an infrastructure company, we're providing. Uh, what we call the fundamental building blocks of space. These are things like uh, solar arrays, avionics, uh, cameras. Uh, so in the image behind me right now, you see an astronaut uh, who's holding on to two cylinders. Uh, those are uh, our rollout solar array uh, products. They're very large solar arrays. So when you see the International Space Station and it looks like it has these wings on them, uh, those are the solar arrays, and, and we build those, uh, and so they've, they've those have been deployed. Uh, so that's an example, providing uh, power to the International Space, Space Station, but it also is providing power for satellites, and um, uh, we also provided cameras for the uh, recent Artemis uh, 1 uh, Orion mission, so we all the cameras and all the imagery you saw uh, coming from Orion as it did its lap around the moon. Those came from red wire cameras. So yeah, these are these are critical uh, infrastructure components. Some, sometimes we like to say it's the picks and shovels of space uh, exploration. Yeah, I, that's, I'm so glad you cleared that up because I know in your, your industry, most of the buzz is coming from the people who are shooting stuff into the sky. And I think stepping back, you know, what goes into that? I almost think of, you know, going to Home Depot before a project and what do you need to pick up? Um, is this, can you clarify, is this just hardware or are there hardware and software components? So it's, the majority of it is uh, hardware, but uh, like almost any hardware system, there's integrated software in a lot of these different uh, hardware capabilities. Uh, as well. So it's not exclusively hardware, but I, I would say the majority is uh, things like the solar arrays or um, there's launch adapters or different uh, structures that are important to satellites or, or power units and things like that. And in terms of where you guys sit on the, in the value chain of space, can you talk about um, at what point you're brought in? Where do you integrate? Is it the beginning, the end, some everywhere along the way? How would you articulate that? Yeah, well, we're a pretty diversified uh, company, and maybe that helps with uh, the amount of revenue that we can generate because uh, we do have a fair number of products. Uh, so the answer is it depends. Uh, and really, there's three primary areas where we participate in the value chain. Uh, probably um, uh, the largest is, a, is as a mission enabler. Uh, where we're a supplier to really large companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin or Blue Origin, uh, where they're buying these, what we refer to as fundamental building blocks or picks and shovels, like they want to put 
uh, solar arrays on a uh, spacecraft or like, you know, uh, on Artemis, they want camera systems or avionics. Um, so in that particular case, uh, we're a little further down in the value chain providing uh, these infrastructure elements um, to a variety of different missions. We work across commercial space, national security space, and civil space. Um, in addition to that, though, 29% of our revenue uh, comes from uh, Europe. Uh, so we're a global company. Uh, and in Europe, we're more of a full mission integrator. We're kind of uh, more act more like the prime contractors. There's a uh, a full satellite that we develop, and we have been developing it for many years uh, for the European Space Agency. Uh, often, like you would say, NASA, uh, uh, they're referred to as ESA. Uh, so ESA buys actually full missions from us. We have uh, a mission coming up uh, for our Proba bus. Uh, where two other satellites are actually going to be flying autonomously in tandem. And uh, so that's kind of really uh, exciting state of the art uh, as well. And then lastly, we have a really interesting element of our organization that is focused on microgravity payload development. And uh, so sometimes you'll see uh, we'll put out information about uh, payloads that we're putting on the International Space Station that can do things like uh, bioprinting. Uh, so we printed uh, recently uh, uh, a, a human meniscus on orbit uh, using our bioprinter, and I can talk a little bit more about that if uh, that's of interest. We also are doing some interesting biotech uh, work with uh, Eli Lilly in pharmaceuticals where we're growing crystals for drug development. So it's really that, you know, picks and shovels, a mission enabler, full systems in Europe, and then lastly, we have some really exciting uh, microgravity payloads we're doing uh, where it's more of this next generation uh, uh, technology for like bio and advanced materials. I appreciate the breakdown there, Peter. And the first thing that you said that really made my ears perk up was national security space, national security business. And that reminds me, in your Q4 earnings call, you had said that your Q4 national security revenue has doubled. What does that mean specifically? Who is buying what from you all? Yeah, so uh, national security is a really interesting uh, area that's um, been growing very rapidly. Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of people are familiar with the formation of the Space Force uh, that has occurred uh, in the last uh, uh, decade here. Uh, and um, so now we have an entire branch of the military dedicated exclusively to space. So that's an example of a national security customer. Of course, our intelligence community also uses space uh, for a variety of missions that they support as well. So um, really, uh, there's been some topical things in the news. Uh, 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 there was a lot of buzz a few weeks ago about some of the things that the Russians are doing in space uh, that uh, is really a threat uh, to our uh, space capability in the United States. So we got to think about how we're going to defend against that threat and where are the capabilities we need to do. Of course, um, satellite is a critical backbone for warfighter communications. Uh, and I think uh, some of our potential adver uh, adversaries recognize, uh, if you go back even as far as um, uh, the first Gulf War, uh, which was really the advent of shock and awe and precision guided munitions, um, this was all uh, dependent on GPS. Uh, now we live in a world where <laughs> uh, almost everything we do, uh, finding your way, uh, you know, uh, on, in your car depends on GPS. Uh, so this is critical infrastructure and, uh, um, um, you know, many of the uh, military uh, organizations have now started referring to space as a, uh, a warfighter domain. Uh, meaning that uh, in in a uh, in a conflict, it would be likely that uh, there would be some sort of conflict occurring concurrently in space, whether it be uh, uh, trying to negate each other's capabilities. So, uh, so w we really need a whole new national se security architecture in order to ensure that our space assets are resilient um, into the future. So, and uh, China has been very aggressive in space. 
Uh, they're investing a lot of money, uh, both from a national security perspective, which, of course, we have to counterbalance, but also s space is a really important soft power. Um, the United States, wherever we go, we tend to go uh, with our international partners. Uh, the International Space Station is no different. Uh, it's really a a, a, a very important uh, piece of U.S. diplomacy. Uh, so now uh, China has a space station as well. And in many cases, we're competing uh, for uh, uh, participation via soft power with uh, other countries, for instance, in the Middle East, uh, who are also looking to participate in uh, space programs uh, that not only include the current space stations, but also ultimately the moon. Um, I think uh, if you were to ask me, we're we're really in a a second space race with China for developing a a permanent presence on the moon. Both the United States and China have uh, uh, plans for that, and it's and it's an important part of soft power. Uh, international diplomacy and 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 really national prestige as well. So there's what you traditionally think of as um, kind of space national security, uh, and then there's also this other element of uh, of competition in space uh, from the diplomatic perspective as well. The the moon kind of battle that you just described. Quickly, like I'm trying to wrap my head around this. What is uh, the benefit of having domination? or dominance on the moon, U.S. versus China? Like, is there a world where likely they will be both there? And if so, like, what kind of advantage does a country have by by setting up shop there? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, uh, there's a number of things that make the moon really exciting. And there's no doubt in my mind that both the United States and China, and perhaps even other countries, uh, will ultimately uh, have a permanent presence on the moon. And, you know, I believe that uh, everyone will be uh, able to peacefully cooperate and uh, coexist on, uh, with presence on the moon. Um, but, you know, it's not always a given. So you have to uh, make sure that uh, we establish norms of behavior. Uh, there's a uh, 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 policy uh, out there called the Artemis Accords that our chief growth officer, Mike Gold, actually had a direct hand in helping shape. Um, Artemis Accords are uh, a set of policies that countries sign on to to agree to certain norms of behavior uh, in space and, and particularly on the moon. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, there's a lot of science to be had from having a permanent uh, uh, human presence on the moon. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you can learn a lot. It's a great place to look out uh, further into space from. Uh, there's a lot of um, still work to be done in characterizing the different uh, elements uh, that are on the moon. There's uh, certainly a search for um, the ability for water and the ability to create fuel from water, uh, because the Earth is also a great uh, stepping off point to go further out in our solar system. So uh, a lot of people believe that the moon is just a first step to ultimately going to Mars. Uh, which would be uh, really exciting. I know SpaceX and uh, certainly Elon Musk has uh, been very vocal about uh, their aspirations uh, to ultimately do that. So a uh, one architecture could be that you fly a, um, a rocket to uh, the moon and use uh, water and oxygen uh, on the moon to make additional fuel that could take you out to Mars or uh, one of the other planetary moons, for instance, that are out in the solar system as well. So I think we're just starting to think about like, hey, what what could be all the great benefits of, of being on the moon? And uh, um, so there's a lot of excitement there in the international community. Yeah, it's weird to think about the moon as a pit stop. Like that that was it for a <laughs> while. And now it's like, we're just going to refuel and, and launch from there. Uh, I want to pivot to space as a research and testing ground for pharma, because this is something that I know is probably not on a lot of people's radars. And you all announced a continued partnership with Eli, Eli Lilly, and you're planning for a second space flight now where they'll be using your infrastructure as a pharmaceutical testing ground. And I would love for you to talk about why space 
why space, why pharma, how that fits together, how you're working with Eli Lilly and what's to come there? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. And so fundamentally in its most simplistic form, uh, the key advantage to any manufacturing in space uh, is uh, the difference in, uh, between regular gravity here on Earth and microgravity, right? So uh, obviously the, the, the gravity is uh, much lower in space. We've seen images of astronauts floating around. Well, that has a very, gravity has a very serious impact on uh, the production of materials. And, and these can be metals, they can be any material, ceramics, plastics, uh, red wire uh, through our re legacy uh, company, Main Space was the first company to ever uh, 3D print on orbit. Uh, so um, it could be biological materials, right? So uh, there's a lot of research and opportunity to understand um, how microgravity uh, affects the manufacturing environment and what benefits can we get from that? And an example of that is our partnership with Eli Lilly. We have uh, a capability that we've developed that we call Pillbox. Uh, and Pillbox uh, is a facility, a payload that goes up to the International Space Station where you can grow crystals uh, from compounds that show potential uh, for future drug development. So, and when you grow crystals in space, uh, because there is no gravity, they tend to be more pure. Uh, they tend to grow larger. And um, these crystals, these uh, uh, you can think of them as like a blueprint of a compound that you would do research on to turn into a future drug. And the higher fidelity of the crystal informs the scientists who are doing the drug development so that they can characterize uh, uh, the uh, different aspects of these compounds uh, uh, in a much a more accurate way. So what happens is you say you're looking at um, a drug for uh, um, heart disease, right? And you look at it and you say, uh, what they do is they use these crystals as kind of a, a map of it. Uh, and then they, uh, they do their uh, development off of that. If they look at, there might be a side effect, for instance, and they're not under sure what's causing this side effect, but they, but if they had a higher fidelity map, uh, they could use that crystal map to perhaps mitigate that um, uh, side effect easier, right? Or they could see some um, aspect of the form of uh, of what they're testing uh, that would make it more effective. So that's very attractive, obviously, to, uh, as a matter of fact, sometimes uh, we think about how many drugs or uh, uh, compounds that, sh that showed a lot of uh, uh, potential benefit, but had uh, side effects that were just unacceptable that might've been put on the shelf. Could we take those off the shelf now, recharacterize them in microgravity, and then find an easier way to mitigate the side effects to get the, the benefit from those. That would be one example uh, of a use case. Yeah. That's insane. I literally, before I turned into your earnings call, had no idea that we were making pharmaceutical drugs in space and had the opportunity to learn a different way of drug making because of the, you know, no gravity. That's just, that's crazy to me. Um, so you know, you guys were part of a cluster of space related special purpose acquisition companies, SPACs, uh, that went public in 2021. Some of those companies haven't been doing that great. You all obviously have been. So what do you think is the main two or three things that set Redwire apart from your competitors? Is it the diversification of products? Is it your different geographies? Is it, you know, what is catalyzing sort of this profitable growth for your company? Yeah, well, um, you know, when the SPAC uh, uh, kind of surge happened, right, uh, fundamentally, when you peel it back, uh, it was really just an opportunity uh, for co companies to accelerate going public, right? So the, uh, um, now it was a pretty broad opportunity. So <laughs> a lot of people took advantage of that dynamic in the market at the time. I think the difference um uh, from us and some others uh, was the fact that we um, already had very mature products that were proven on orbit. Uh, we already had a fair amount of revenue. 
uh, actually as a private company, we were also profitable. Uh, so it was, you know, it was really about where we were in the maturation of our offerings uh, compared to others. And I think uh, once all the sediment settles down or the smoke clears around those companies, space companies that uh, uh, went public via SPAC, uh, you'll find that the ones that had really mature products with um, um, spaceflight heritage and were proven on orbit that were uh, already uh, had a broad set of customers and were already making sales and had good revenue and a path to profitability, um, those companies are the ones I think that you're going to see are the ones that uh, will be the ultimate winners. And in a few years, we won't even be talking about a SPAC versus, you know, there's really no difference once you're public. <laughs> you don't totally, get special totally. rules if you're a SPAC. You're public, you're public, right? So uh, people start uh, to talk less about the how you went public and more uh, how you're doing as a public company. But but by and large, I think you'll, you'll look back and you'll see that the really successful ones had uh, proven capabilities with a pretty well-defined customer base that, you know, we call that space now, meaning space in the present uh, versus uh, some companies that might've had more aspirational um, uh, business models that uh, uh, with without current customers. Peter, and you talk about SPACs not having special privileges, but they seem to have reputations for better or for worse, and you kind of get bundled into this, this group, uh, a cohort of companies. And I loved how you articulated on your earnings call uh, calling Redwire a not a maybe someday company. And is that, in addition to that being a testament of kind of having these existing products versus investing into a, a, some pipe dream, is it also due to the fact of like where you sit on the value chain and like some of those other space stocks were a little ahead of the market? I think of things like commercial trips into into space. Um, is that is that part of it? It's it's where you sit in the value chain versus um, some of these other space companies out there that you might want to think about a little bit differently if you're an investor. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to have a strong foundation of revenue generating products now that uh, uh, are going to you know generate revenue, generate cash flow, uh, ultimately generate profitability. Uh, uh, we had 15 million dollars in uh, EBITDA. Uh, this year, and and th and that's important in this environment. Now, in fairness uh, to uh, this, you know, our fellow space companies, the market changed dramatically. Uh, the macro environment changed dramatically. Money got a lot more expensive. A lot of these companies uh, may have been very successful and closed their business case uh, uh, if uh, there was still the same amount of capital out there uh, going to space companies. But you know, it actually ended up benefiting. Uh, those who who have programs now, you know, you can see, like I said, behind me, our solar arrays uh, being installed on the International Space Station. That's a really compelling thing to uh, uh, go to market with and and to point to customers. Like uh, I think you might have mentioned, we recently had a 142 million dollar uh, contract award from an undisclosed satellite manufacturer up for our Rosa product. It's a it's a smaller form factor. Uh, but similar technology. Well, when you go in and you talk about uh, customers who are building satellites and you can point to on-orbit performance associated with the International Space Station, again, that's that's not a someday company. That's that's very compelling. However, you know, I wouldn't dismiss uh, um, that uh, that's that potential uh, for breakout technologies too. Um, I'll often say Redwire has a blue chip foundation with venture optionality. And what I mean by that is uh, we're going to generate generate good revenue, um, good cash flow associated uh, with selling uh, our power systems, with selling our structures or our avionics for a current space infrastructure. But, you know, we're not making a ton of money on these future things like the pharmaceuticals or uh, uh, we have a, a, a biofabrication facility, essentially a a 3D bioprinter uh, that uh, we recently demonstrated printing a human meniscus on orbit. The, you know, that's the venture optionality. That's that's exciting someday stuff, but 
uh, our strategy has always been um, heritage plus innovation, blue chip foundation plus venture optionality. You know, make sure you have things that customers are buying and deploying in space today uh, so that you can thrive and ultimately be around long enough, uh, regardless of the economic environment, because uh, it changes, as we all know, that we'll be around long enough to, to really realize the full potential of some of these more uh, out there uh, technologies that show great promise. You know, Peter, I'm really glad you mentioned a lot of these numbers because let's talk earnings, right? That's what this podcast is all about. So first off, congrats on the incredible year. You guys seem to be doing everything right. Your revenue increased by 52%, net income improved by over $100 million, free cash flow improved by nearly $29 million, and adjusted EBITDA by more than $26 million. So you're now a free cash flow and adjusted EBITDA positive company. Your net loss is shrinking. You guided to $300 million million in revenue in 2024. We touched on this a little bit before, but now that I've got the numbers in front of me, I want to hear specifically from you, what is driving this profitable growth, right? What were some key levers that you guys pulled in 2023 to say, no, we're going to be adjusted EBITDA positive, we're going to be free cash flow positive, and we are going to continue trending toward that direction in 24 and beyond? Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question, and thank you, by the way. Um, uh, we're very proud, and very proud of the all the employees at Redwire uh, that were able to have such a extraordinary year for us. Um, again, I think we have really long term relationships with a lot of the major customers. Um, we work across national security, uh, civil, and uh, commercial space to include international space as well. So the diversity helps. Um, in addition to not only having uh, things that are really exciting today that are going up in orbit, but also having these future technology, uh, the diversity of customer base. And this allows us to pivot, right? So um, when capital was uh, much more freely available, interest rates were lower and uh, people were investing a lot, commercial space was very hot. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, a really exciting uh, customers there for us, since we uh, a, a large part of our bit uh, part of our business is providing the uh, mission enabling picks and shovels for these commercial space missions. Um, that was really exciting. But when uh, that dried up, um, uh, national security uh, got hot. So uh, I think we had talked a little bit about uh, totally. In the last year, uh, we doubled our national security. Uh, uh, revenue associated with that. So that kind of resiliency associated with having a diversified portfolio and really long-term uh, customer relationships uh, across all of the different mission areas of space is, has, has been important uh, for Redwire. So, uh, so right now we're riding the wave in national security. Um, there's a lot of excitement about lunar infrastructure. Uh, we announced last mm -hmm. year a, uh, a NASA uh, program, I believe it was $12.9 million NASA program to look at the technologies that would be necessary uh, to build landing pads uh, and ultimately roads uh, on the moon. Uh, so when you start looking at this idea of having a permanent uh, presence on the moon, um, there's a lot of interest in uh, lunar infrastructure. We'll participate in that because we have uh, that civil element to our portfolio as well. So you don't want to uh, be too broad, uh, and I don't think we are. Some people say, well, Redwire does a lot. How do you keep track of it? I say, well, we don't do launch. <laughs> uh, you know, we're not a launch company. We're not selling data. We don't have our own constellation. There's a lot we're not doing, right? We don't do ground infrastructure. But, um, you know, with the continuing decrease in the cost of launch, uh, there's, uh, I would believe there's a strongly correlated trend as, the cost of launch goes down, the demand for space infrastructure goes up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we often use our tagline build above because we're 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 essentially, you know, instead of building hotels or office spaces or uh road infrastructure, you know, terrestrial, we we do uh, you know, something analogous uh uh for space and 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 it being kind of a diversified there, there being a, a diversified portfolio, I think helps. Yeah. Very cool. And unlike here on Earth, I mean, that that real estate is kind of infinite, right? I mean, literally infinite. Uh, so that's that's also another interesting angle to what you're doing. Like, how do you know what the ceiling is? 
potentially? And is there one to people who are building in your space? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, the, the TAM is large, right? To your point. And uh, I think you're hitting on something that's really important. Um, a lot of people, they think of space and they think of satellites, right? Because uh, that's, that's, I think, which is, the, you know, the most visible. Um, but it's, it's more than that, right? First of all, you have satellites in low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geostationary Earth orbit. Uh, so there's multiple orbits. Uh, then you have the idea of lunar infrastructure. You also have deep space exploration. Uh, you have, there's a uh, really uh, exciting uh, uh, upcoming trend towards the development of commercial space stations that we haven't talked about yet, but that's really exciting as well. And if you're going to be putting up commercial space stations, which uh, I believe we ultimately will be because it's on NASA's roadmap and, and the International Space Station isn't going to last forever. Uh, so you, that's a whole nother element of uh, space infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, every time somebody comes up with a new idea on how to use space, uh, we get really excited because that's uh, another potential opportunity to uh, uh, provide some sort of infrastructure elements. Peter, you were pretty adamant during your earnings call not to provide quarterly revenue estimates, and that was uh, attributed to the the lumpiness of sort of your revenue and how these large projects that are signed can take course over months, years on. Uh, can you explain why this is the case in your industry and how it's how investors should think about this maybe a little bit differently uh, than companies that they're investing in that might have more of a predictable revenue? month to month or even quarter to quarter? Yeah, no, it's a it's a fantastic question. And um, there's a number of different elements to it. First and foremost is um, the vast majority of our uh, business development or, or bids as we refer them to um, have a pretty long sales cycle, right? And they're, uh, 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 it's kind of, and they, and they tend to be uh, large as a percentage of revenue. So you kind of, you know, something like, roll out solar arrays for the International Space Station, you'll win it, it'll be a multi-year contract, it'll be large as a total percentage of uh, your revenue, You're, you'll burn that over time. Uh, we like to use this metric called book to bill. That's simply uh, the amount of work that you're, that you're winning, contracts that you're winning um, um, over the amount of revenue, the work, you know, executing the work that you're doing, right? So. Uh, you want that uh, to be uh, greater than one uh, because that uh, tells you that you're actually bringing in contracts uh, that you can continue to work on to sustain uh, a certain amount of revenue generation um, going going forward. Uh, usually, we look at a LTM and then we project uh, on a on a on a forward looking uh, twelve month basis based on what our current book to bill is, but. But what'll happen is, you know, you'll 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 have a great bookings quarter um, that'll generate a lot of contract backlog. Another term we like to talk about, and then you spend a few quarters burning that backlog down, and then another deal uh, or two um, will come in that will then replenish that backlog. And you, you know, you so your book to bill will go up and down. So you know, it it tends to when you're dealing kind of with the loss smaller numbers. Uh, we're bidding things uh, that are multiples of Redwire's total revenue on multi-year contracts, right? So, for instance, uh, uh, you know, we did uh, uh, two hundred forty-three point eight uh, million in revenue uh, in twenty twenty-three, but we won a, a two-year one hundred forty-two million dollar contract in Q four of twenty twenty-three. Uh, Whereas I know people in Q3 were kind of looking at our book to bill and saying like, oh, guys, you know, are like, you know, how's it going here, right? Uh, we right, haven't seen right. uh, really great contract awards. And, you know, I sit there with, uh, you know, I sit there and, 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 and just try to say it's lumpy, folks, knowing that we have uh, some of these bids working through our pipeline. Um, um, so, you know, you might, I think we drive ourselves crazy if we tried to... Uh, uh, estimate these timings. Many of them can be dependent on factors like uh, uh, the government budget, right? So, uh, 
you know, we might be thinking we're going to close something in Q4 or early Q1, and then you have a continuing resolution and the budgets don't get approved. And then that's pushed out. And then, you know, investors are Classic disappointed. Classic government yeah. budgets, man. Am I, t- come on now. <laughs> just trying, to, just trying to be topical, right? <laughs> Well, let's, let's keep the government. conversation about the bidding going because, you know, you guys bid on $944 million worth of contracts to be awarded, right? And I just want to know, like, what's the bidding process like? How do you select the $944 million? You mentioned you have a pipeline, I think, on your earnings. You said it's $5 billion. So why are you only bidding on, like, call it 20% of the total pipeline? And then of those, call it $944 million of bids, how long is the selection process versus, like, hey, you got selected, now you can realize revenue. I think you mentioned like you guys are trying to focus on the contracts that kind of pay some revenue up front. So like, how are you guys really approaching the bidding process? Yeah, no, great question. So the, um, so everything starts as um, an opportunity, if you will, right? If you think about different phases of the pipeline, um, you know that uh, an organization is uh, planning to develop a constellation um, and we have a number of products that could be helpful in that, or there's a, uh, an advertised uh, future request for proposal that might be coming out of the government. We identify that early. Um, if you take the summation of all those uh, identified opportunities and put that together, that is our pipeline, our $4 billion pipeline number, right? And then the opportunities, and it, it varies by product. Some of the uh, uh, smaller products like cameras, uh, have a shorter um, sales cycle. Uh, they tend they tend not to, uh, you know, they're they're smaller dollar amounts. Um, um, you can have greater turnaround. Some of the bigger opportunities, like a full satellite system, uh, can have a year or greater. Or a good example is our international birthing and docking mechanism. Uh, that's a that's a large piece piece of infrastructure that can have a, a really long uh, sales cycle. Uh, associated with like a future space station or or something like that. So, uh, but they all kind of move through this pipeline from like an identified opportunity, uh, qualified opportunity, some might say, uh, to uh, something that we're in the process of bidding on. And then ultimately this idea is uh, a, a submitted bid. And that's what the 900 refer- references. It's of this $4 billion pipeline the ones that are at the latter stage of the pipeline, meaning you could see a near-term award, that's that's what we call, you know, the bids under submission um, uh, that are being evaluated. So that so that's what we think about. But it's uh, again, diversity helps us because we kind of have these big ones that are moving through the pipeline, uh, big boulders, if you will, that are moving through the pipeline. But we like to fill in the gaps with the. Uh, you know, what we'll call singles and doubles or whatever the terminology you want to use where you're saying like, hey, you know, let's get a couple million dollar wins uh, to keep uh, our book to bill going. Uh, uh, a couple million along. dollar yeah. wins like they're singles and doubles. I mean, he's like, yeah, you know, just a couple million dollars, nothing crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised how, uh, how much uh, effort it takes to keep, you know, to keep the pipeline yeah. uh, moving, you know, and uh, uh, and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to. Again, we're not a we're not a someday company. We want to we want to constantly be participating in launch and putting stuff on orbit. Yeah. That's that generates revenue in the here and now, and then it, you know you fill that in with some of these 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 big wins that can again materially level. Uh, us up as well. So it's it's a mix. Peter, real quick, when you say bid, I think a lot of us uh, and a lot of folks listening, when we pitch in our jobs, it's slides, presentation, like the due diligence is maybe a couple meetings. Is a bid really just a series of proof points and hurdles that you need to demonstrate uh, capability and trustworthiness before it's signed? Like, what does that look like in your world? Yeah, no, yeah, it, it varies. Um, commercial companies tend to have a different bid process than government, and of course, international uh, government and commercial uh, could be different as well. Um, uh, the government's is the easiest to describe because it's very much like um, for your investors out there who are familiar with the uh, aerospace model um, or you know defense aerospace government contracting model. It's very much the same, right? So the uh, uh, the government will have an 
solicitation. Uh, they'll put together a request for a proposal. Uh, they'll define the specification and the bid uh, process on how companies can compete by submitting proposals, depending on the size of the opportunity that can, uh, and of course the size of their budget that can uh, happen relatively quickly or it can uh, take a while. And, and those tend to be very formal uh, 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 bids. Uh, they are working and the government has, I think, made great strides in um, uh, agile acquisition with, uh, I think one of the organizations that's getting a lot of press because they had a significant plus up in their budget this year is uh, the D Defense Innovation Unit, DIUX. Uh, uh, they obviously can move things through uh, the process uh, quicker, but uh, whereas the commercial, it may be if, you know, they're trying to buy a camera and it's largely been specked out and uh, they're trying to move fast. Uh, it can be it can be totally. a pretty short sales cycle. They just send over a a purchase order. Uh, Apple and, Pay, uh, even ready. you know, just one click checkout. Yeah, I don't know that <laughs> <laughs> we're not quite there. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Uh, uh, you know, it'd be yet. nice if you go up the red wire and uh, yeah, order yourself a robotic arm uh, with a click. But uh, uh, we're not there yet. So I'll be on the lookout for that Cash App Red Wire partnership. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Peter. So kind of moving on now from earnings a little bit more toward your leadership style and you as a personal just like leader here, right? You're a former Marine officer. And you've mentioned actually in your last earnings call that you have a high level security clearance and you've worked in national security for your entire career. What's it mean to have a high level security clearance? I mean, is there anything secret and cool that you can tell the world right now? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> no the, uh, He's like, no way. Or, or, or no fortunately, way. I cannot. I would say so. The uh, so yeah, I started out my career once I graduated from college. I was commissioned as a uh, second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, uh, and uh, really had an extraordinary time uh, learning leadership. Quite frankly, that was my my first experience uh, with uh, uh, being a leader. Uh, in the United States Marine Corps, and I, I, I'm biased, but I think they do a fantastic job uh, training young leaders. Um, I did four years uh, and then returned to get my uh, MBA from the University of Maryland uh, after I got out. Uh, but that time was very formative for me. Uh, I will tell you, Redwire, on our uh, executive team, our CFO was a fighter pilot in the Air Force. Uh, our CIO is a retired Navy captain, I believe, who was also uh, flew, but also worked in um, uh, IT systems for the Navy. Uh, our head of national security space is uh, a retired uh, a colonel who worked for the Air Force and also the NRO. Uh, we have a lot of uh, former military leadership uh, uh, not only in our management team, but throughout our organization. And we're, uh, I'm all, I always feel really good about hiring veterans. You know, they just really? come with a certain amount of discipline and sure. uh, work Perspective ethic. too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. perspective, yeah. maturity. Um, uh, it's great. So yeah, that was, that was formative. And then um, I, I got my MBA and uh, I did some entrepreneurial uh, work uh, for a little bit. And after 9-11, I wanted to get back into the national security business and uh, uh, cut my teeth at Booz Allen, uh, which is a, a great uh, a company. Uh, a really, you know, I often, I, I have uh, young adult children, and I will say to them, it's, uh, it's good to go to a, a big, reputable company to really learn, uh, you know, how uh, an industry, a particular industry operates to take advantage of their uh, uh, leadership programs, their development programs, even their technical development programs. Obviously, really big companies uh, invest a lot in their their people, so that's good. So, so I I benefit from that. Um, got the entrepreneurial uh, bug again and uh, uh, started working uh, with private equity backed. Uh, companies. This is actually my third private equity backed company, but they were all had some sort of national security element uh, to them. And therefore, uh, in order to um, do my job, I needed a security clearance. And, you know, it's exciting for me because uh, one of the things I think is uh, really um, exciting about Redwire is I like to say we hit above our weight class in terms of the ability to do 
a classified work. Um, that's a barrier to entry for most companies our size. Uh, we've invested a lot in uh, in the in the um, architectures, the investments, the uh, a capital infrastructure that you need. You need certain facilities. Uh, you need uh, cleared people. You need contracts uh, that give you uh, these uh, uh, permission. Uh, you need a program that ensures that we're going to protect uh, the government's information. Uh, so that gives us an advantage because there's certain things that we can bid on. Uh, that other companies are our, our size can't um so yeah that's awesome that's very cool yeah and peter thank you for your service um and uh not to harp on the security clearance i know we can't we can't pry in there too much but i'm curious you seem like a guy that knows a lot like a lot more than most people uh specific to national security but also space is there anything about space that scares you well, first of all, I want you to take that clip and send it to me so I can send it to my uh, young adult children. Because <laughs> they might say, sometimes I wonder if they, they uh, really believe yeah, it. Yeah, if you're listening, your dad is about... really cool. Uh, <laughs> clip it. They might dispute that I'm a guy I... who knows a lot about a lot of things. But so I appreciate the comment. And it's always uh, good to hear. Um, you know, anything associated with national security can be scary. Uh, there was a, um, I think it was a, some media that was put out, I believe it was from the Space Force, but don't quote me on that, uh, a while ago, that was called The Day Without Space. And um, what it was all about, the, 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 the premise, and this is probably something you can find on YouTube, was what would happen if, uh, to our society if we didn't have access to space? Um, mm. GPS, like I already mentioned, it's not just about uh, finding your way uh, to somewhere you've never been before. Uh, the timing aspect of GPS is very important uh, for the systems that underpin a lot of our critical infrastructure. Uh, and of course, um, it's a critical aspect of our uh, communications architecture to include emergency uh, communication architecture, um, of course, military communication uh, is uh, highly dependent on um, space-based assets. And uh, so, yeah, so I think it's important uh, for the, uh, the public uh, to understand uh, the dependency we have on space and that if we don't have access to space, that's a really bad day <laughs> for uh, our society. So, um um, I wouldn't commerce. be able to listen to my serious XM radio anymore, man. That'd be. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. You know, just think about how stressed out everybody uh, would be if they couldn't get, uh, you know, their chill music uh, from uh, Sirius XM or. East Street uh, Radio. You got the Springsteen station. Can't live without <laughs> it. Yeah. Now, yeah, last question here for you, you, Peter, before we uh, wrap things up. Do you believe in aliens? And have you ever seen evidence supporting that aliens are real, considering how many times you guys have been to space, seen space, been around space? What's up with aliens? Real? Not real? Give me, shoot me straight. Yeah, yeah. So I believe in a high probability. And there's a, uh, a, a thing out there called Drake's Equation. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, Drake's Equation takes... Oh, gosh, don't quote me on it. You can look it up. But it takes the number of galaxies times the number of stars in each galaxy times the number of planets around potential planets around each uh, star uh, comes up with the number of potential planets in a universe that could support life. And although there's a very low probability that uh, there's a planet that supports life, although we found many of these exoplanets already. Uh, with uh, Even though it may be a low probability, when you multiply it by just how many stars there are in the universe, the number, uh, the solution to the equation starts to grow so high that it's almost a certainty. Uh, so, uh, so I believe that uh, it's really highly probable. Now, of course, the universe is so extraordinarily vast. Uh, you could then do a calculation of what's the probability that you know humans would ever uh, interact 
uh, with uh, uh, intelligence life, uh, intelligent life out there. You know that that might be a very low number because right, uh, space right. is just so big, and they would have to be so advanced, um, uh, much more advanced than us. We're we're still working on. You know, we've been to the moon. We're still working on that permanent presence. And maybe once we get out to Mars or or farther, uh, that probability will go up. But uh, for now, I think it's still pretty low. So. Uh, I'm open-minded, um, but I do believe that uh, there's a high probability of intelligence life out in the universe somewhere. You heard it here I first. I have not seen any evidence, but uh, <laughs> again, our chief growth officer, Mike Gold, uh, uh, is was involved in the UA, uh, I think it's called UAP uh, uh, committee, and uh, the government, NASA, and the Department of Defense in, in, included have be, started to open up and have uh, put together a number of committees to uh, start taking uh, anomalous behavior more seriously, and I, and I think that's I think that's good for for the nation and for the world. I I think if there's anom anomalous activity, whether it be uh, caused by aliens or not, out there, we should know about it. <laughs> we should know totally uh, what agree. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, with that being said, everyone, thanks so much for hanging out with us on this episode of After Earnings. Peter, we really enjoyed the interview and we can't wait to have you back, hopefully, here pretty soon. Katie, oh my goodness. Are you just ready to jump on a SpaceX rocket right now and just yeah. go to the moon? Eject like, I am me so into thrilled space. after I'm this. I'm ready. Yeah. That was, <laughs> I'm hyped up. I'm ready to go. So, Mars, Mars so colonization. What was, what was your biggest takeaway from this interview? Few things really stood out for me. One was just getting the lowdown on the economics of a space infrastructure company. So how business is won, what's the bidding process like, the diversity of projects and programs from smaller things like solar panels, which by the way, isn't that small, to much larger projects where it might take a year to win the business. I thought that was really fascinating to hear. Also understanding the metrics that matter for investors that are looking into the space economy, things like book to bill ratio, things like backlog, getting to know those terms as they apply uniquely to that area. And also just his general POV on space and in his point that, you know, not the unknown is actually not as scary as uh, not having access to learn about space. And I thought that was a really, really uh, poignant thing for him to point out and made me think a little bit differently about space. Same here. I mean, how he mentioned near the end there of if we didn't have access to space, how different our lives would be, not just from a GPS perspective, but I couldn't listen to Sirius XM radio when I'm driving around. I mean, oh my gosh. Um, but I do think though, some cool things that he mentioned first off was, you know, what they're doing with Eli Lilly. I think that's really important, especially as it relates to taking these existing drugs off of the side effects are too harmful shelf and now kind of beginning to reimagine what those could look like with the aid of microgravity and crystals and everything around that. That's super cool. And then I also liked how we broke down to your point, talking about the pipeline and the bids and the contracts and the backlog, just to really add some additional color to the retail investors tuning in right now, trying to learn more about this company. So really, really cool. And uh, I, I enjoyed it. Totally agree with you, Austin, right there with you. And with that, I'm Katy Perry. And I'm Austin Hankwitz. And this was the After Earnings Podcast brought to you by Stakeholder Labs and Morning Brew. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this episode with a friend if you learned something new about space like we certainly did. And we will catch you on the next episode.